All right, here we are for lesson number four of Homemaking University. And today we are going to be talking about food. Today we are talking about planning and cooking meals. Now, this is not going to be, as you can see, I'm in my office. This is not going to be a, this is how you bake bread or this is how you cook the soup. This is about planning once again. So far, that's been our modus operandi for this class. And that's what I have found, at least in my homemaking experience, that makes the biggest difference is to have a plan, to have a vision, to know what uh, you're going to be doing in your home. And it helps your family to know what's happening in your home. So I'm all about the planning. So I'm excited to get started on this subject today. First, I want to ask you about your assignment from last time, which was the weekly planning. Were any of you able to work on that? Or what did you think about that? Or has that done anything for your homemaking? So I think I was confused from the time before that because I did the assignment for that time, the time before that. Oh. <laughs> so I had already done like, I have like a to-do list app and oh, I nice. put, different. So I have a to-do list for every day and then I just put different things for every day. So that's what works for me. And, oh, that's great. But then I know I, I only have to get that stuff done that day. And that was helpful for me. Oh, good. I'm so glad that helped. Yeah. Well, that's great. And they're, they're pretty inextricably linked, you know, <laughs> and, and you have to do what works for you. So that's the whole point. Anybody else able to work on any of that or Becca, I see you nodding. Yeah, um, I filled this out. Oh, great. <laughs> and, and it was helpful. The only problem I ran into is I was so busy trying to get the things done that I had said I was going to do that day that I neglected my morning and evening to-do list. Oh, like, <laughs> so it's just hard when you add another thing. I've got to like build on it. <laughs> Right. Right. Yeah. And that's why, you know, if you want to put that off too, that, and maybe we should have given a little bit more extra time on that. Um, but it is good to have your, have your habits. If you can get those routines into habit mode and that might take a couple of weeks. Hi, Amanda, AKA Elizabeth, Hi. That's my daughter. Emma. She goes by Elizabeth on Zoom, but <laughs> anyway, so, um, Maybe that's wise, Becca, is, you know, if you're not ready to add that in, if that's going to keep you from getting those routines automatic, maybe you can hold off on adding that. So that's a great point. All right. Anybody else have any comments about any of the previous assignments or questions? All right. Let's get started then. So first thing is that in our home, I need, especially, I'm so glad this has been automated for us for years because now that I'm not home and my kids have to be more independent and my husband um, is home more than me, um, I'm so glad we had this, this time where we have planned things that's become ingrained in our family culture. So we plan weekly what our menus are. Now, we've also done two weeks at a time uh, at times when I've been very pregnant, at the end of a pregnancy, I will even plan for a month uh, just to automate things. And because if I don't know what's going to happen and when babies are going to arrive and all of that business. So you just need to kind of play with it and work for you, try what's best for you. I think a week is a really good place to start. It's not so overwhelming. You can plan your week. And having said that, I want to say that one thing, especially that I think about at this change of seasons is to adjust your menu. Everybody gets a little tired of the same old thing. And so we usually have a cold weather menu and, and it's not the same all the time, but just kind of a list of dishes we make during cold weather seasons and a list of dishes we make during hot seasons. Now, I raised my family for 15 years in Arizona and it is hot. You do not wanna turn the oven on in July or August or June or May. So 
or September. So you just don't want to turn the oven on. And so we came up with a list of dishes that we had that were oven free. So uh, that was something that really helped us. We had a list of dishes uh, that were we did on the stovetop. We used our slow cooker. And now my husband really loves to use the pressure cooker. Now I'm gonna probably talk about my husband a lot during this portion because he is a better cook than I am. He just really is. And he really likes to try new things. He grew up uh, with a mother who's an excellent cook. My mother-in-law is amazing. And so he really enjoys that. It's a talent he has. And I have been spoiled to have that. And I know not everybody has that. But um, he, he does a lot of the cooking at our house. So we would make that list. And then we'd make a list. I made a list of like comfort foods or seasonal foods, things you know, there's dishes that you may want to make once or twice before you try them for Thanksgiving dinner or that kind of thing. So I just had this list of dishes. This is not scheduled on a day or anything. It's just a straight out thinking list of what do we eat? And maybe some dishes of what do I want to try? What have, you know, the kids said they liked aunt so-and-so's this and that. Maybe I could try her recipe and we can do that one night. So it's just a list and this is the list you will work off of when you're planning your menu it just it's just again that decision fatigue and that having to think through everything what if there's just a list what if i think once and i write it down then i also keep these lists in my cookbook so i really like to have a physical cookbook just because my children are different ages and they don't all have phones and apps and access to the computer very much so that's what works for us. Now, I also have recipes in my Google Docs or whatever cloud uh, service you have that you want to use. And that has been nice because if ever someone says, oh, I love this, that you brought it a potluck or whatever, you can, sh can I have the recipe? Yeah, sure. You get their email, you just send it to them that way. So that's been a good place. One good thing about that is it doesn't get dirty. <laughs> is that you don't get mess all over it. I know my cookbook's kind of a sight. Um, and then you, it's just always there. And again, you can share it with whoever you'd like to. One thing that my husband does because he loves to experiment with dishes and he is a web programmer. So he has a website and he has a recipes portion on his website. So he will put his recipes there. And that has worked really nice for our grown kids when they don't live at home, because they could say, hey, dad, at the family dinner, I really like this. I'd want to try it at home. And he could say, okay, we'll just go to the website. It's on the website. And he puts them there frequently. All right. So when it comes to a physical book, this is already dirty again, is I just got this at Target in the dollar aisle. You know what I'm saying? And it just had like the, it has the dividers, and it had pages that you could fill out. I gotta find ones I didn't stick in there. So it had just, oh, I glued them on there too. <laughs> so it just has a thing you can fill out. These are available all over the place. You can find them online, even for free if you go looking. Um, and there wasn't any recipes in here. This is just a place for me to put my recipes. So that's kind of been nice. And I change this out every few years because we beat the heck out of ours uh, because I do let my children use them because they do cook and we'll talk about that. Another thing um, that we have used is, especially when my kids are learning to cook, I will print out a recipe, put it on cardstock and laminate it and then put it on a ring. These are dishes. This is our breakfast palette. So they use this we used to make breakfast every day. Now, because we're so busy, we actually have added cereal and other uh, faster items in there that we'll talk about. But um, this has been kind of a fun thing and they can wipe it off. If you look closely, you can see that rarely happens, but they can wipe it off. Okay, so now to get into more of the planning and this is just an idea. Remember, all these things are just ideas. But one thing that helped me again with the decision fatigue, so I've got my list of dishes we eat or dishes we want to try, right? And this can be for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. What I usually do first and foremost is I repeat meals. So what that means is for our family, you know, on Monday morning, it's going to usually be eggs or on Tuesday morning, it's going to usually be pancakes or whatever it is. I don't even remember. 
Oh, and I didn't bring my menu. Um, so we make our menu on a spreadsheet and uh, it's one that my husband and I share. There have been times when I have been the meal planner and then I do the shopping. And right now, because of my busyness, my husband's less busyness, he is the one that makes the menu and he goes shopping. Now, he usually will share it with me and we'll usually discuss it before he goes shopping. So sometimes if we've got two eyeballs looking at it, we can say, oh, we assigned this child on breakfast and lunch that day. That's probably not going to be fair or good for them. And they do not like that, obviously. So um, we look it over. Another thing that we do is we do the same lunches. So those are two things we keep the same. Now we might mix it up. So on Tuesday and Thursday, say we might do sandwiches, but that's not the same sandwiches. So one week on Tuesday morning, it might be tuna sandwiches. And the next week on Tuesday, not morning, Tuesday lunch, it might be peanut butter and jelly or whatever. So your mileage may vary. Um, I just love having that, those less, decisions to make, that it's already decided. Everybody knows Wednesday is the quesadilla day. There's not an argument, Friday is gonna be ramen or whatever it is. That's, and it actually creates a lot of stability. Now, some people and kids might complain about it, but honestly, it's again with the routines. It's knowing what to expect. It's one less thing to worry about. You just already know it. So that's my little soapbox, breakfast and lunches. We, we mix them up sometimes, we change things sometimes, but for the most part, it just makes it easier because dinners get old faster than anything else, at least in our experience. So when we plan our dinners, this is how I simplify those decisions is that I make different nights, different planned themes, you might say. So about 10 years ago, and I get a lot of these things from my blog. I have to look back. I did blog for more than 10 years and I recorded a lot of the things we were doing. It was a homemaking blog, so it makes it pretty handy. But at that time, every Monday night, we were having Mexican food, whatever that was, it just simplified the decision. And we had a few Mexican dishes that were staples that we did often. Everybody knew how to make them. Everybody knew what ingredients they required and all of that business. So that was, our, that was our Monday nights. Tuesday nights, we would do chicken, that's some kind of chicken dish. Wednesday night, we, at the time, we were heavily um, busy with a homeschool co-op. It was in fact in our home, at, well, off and on, we had one in our home, we also would go to one. And so it was just a busy day. It was the day I loaded up, it was my errand day. Remember when we talked about planning that? So that was the day I had tried to get all the lessons done that day, and that was just our running day. So I used a slow cooker that day. Then I had that planned ahead. And I knew that morning I was going to put the roast or the chicken or whatever it was in the slow cooker and get it started before I left that day. And then when we got home, we would just sit down and eat. It was super nice. Then Thursdays, I would do a rice dish. Fridays, I would do pasta. Saturdays, I would do a casserole or a soup. And then Sundays, I would try to keep simple. Now, um, for us, this meant like a potato, baked potato bar or something. Um, we still actually feed a crowd on Sunday because that's the day a lot of our married kids come home. Um, it's not every Sunday because that gets overwhelming. We frequently do potluck for that, but we try and keep it simple. And usually that's for lunch. So in the evenings, we often just have popcorn. And I know a lot of people do that on Sundays. Just seems like we just kind of stretch our meals out. We eat late that day, just things like that. And so we try to keep that simple. Okay. So does anyone have any questions so far? I know that's kind of a fire hose here at the beginning. Okay. All right. And maybe you already do this in your family. The thing about making a plan is Sometimes we, we may have to change things. Uh, I know in our family, when it's someone's birthday, we usually let them pick the dishes that day. It's just a little thing that makes their day special, we hope. And um, so then we might change things up. For example, yesterday was my now 16-year-old daughter's birthday. And 
she wanted the breakfast, which is everybody's favorite. We have it every Friday morning, which is an egg bake casserole that my husband makes. And so she wanted that, but she wanted it on her birthday. And so we switched things up. So today, our usual dish, we switched that up. So that, that keeps things interesting. Um, know when to stick to your plan and know when to change it. So sometimes you might say, we're going to experiment with this dish and you try it and nobody likes it. Nobody will eat it. It's generally wise not to repeat that dish. <laughs> you just had your confirmation. Now you might want to repeat it when they, when time has passed, maybe they'll forget. Maybe they get older and they might like it this time. Um, but know when to say, okay, this is not one to keep on the list, at least for the near future. Um, and sometimes you might have someone, I have dietary restrictions. I eat differently than the rest of my family, which makes things a little interesting because then kids kind of go, how can mom gets to eat this? I have to eat Honestly, they don't want to eat when I'm eating, which is why I don't make them. I'm eating a big bowl of broccoli and they're going, mm, I don't want that, you know? So it's not like they're tempted by it, but especially as they get older, they start to say, can I just make ramen? That's like the one thing. Sometimes we allow that depending on how messy the kitchen is or on the child and their behavior or all of those kinds of things. Um, and sometimes our go-to is if you don't like this, you can make toast. Everybody can knows how to make toast. They can make their own toast. Um, I, we don't let them eat cereal as a substitute. That's, that's everybody who does their own thing. For us, we don't do that because uh, it's expensive. And so uh, cereal is something we didn't used to eat even in our family, but we do now, but it's not one they can just have as a snack. It's, we're pretty specific on that one. Everybody needs to do what's best for their family and what works for theirs. So one thing that I feel is important about a menu is that it's not a secret that only mom or dad knows. It needs to be visual and it needs to be seen. This helps a lot of the, what's for breakfast today? What's for dinner tonight? I mean, they still do it, but I can go, it's on the fridge. It's in the same place that it's been for years. You know where it is, go look. Um, the thing is, is that it needs to be in a place where they can easily see it and read it. And the great thing about having this, so we do it in a spreadsheet and then we print it out and we update it and we put it up each week. And we're gonna get to delegating cooking, but it's also necessary because our kids do cook. And we have other, we have different family members that cook throughout the week, it's not just me. Now this is probably different for a lot of you. You may be the one that cooks all the time. So I'm gonna gloss over that part today, but you can get that end stick it in your brain and use it for as your kids grow. I know a lot of you have young children that are in this group. So um, it's important for them. We put on that, on that menu who's cooking. We also put who's doing the dishes. So those two things are important uh, for everybody to know. Here's another great thing about a menu on the fridge. Even if you don't have assignments for people, even if you just have it there for you and nobody else can read in your house, except your husband, hopefully, is... Um, Nobody can argue with it. I don't know what it is. There's something powerful. And we talked about this. I talked about this in the last video on cleaning is that when you delegate, that's one thing to tell a kid to do stuff, then they can argue with you. It's another thing to have this official looking chart that you put upon your fridge that then they go, oh, I'm on dishes. They can't argue with a list. And it's funny. They don't argue with me. If it's on a list, it's like the list is the law. And so they don't, they don't argue with me. It's fabulous. I love that part. So um, that's the power of having a printed menu. It's like, look, the work is done. It's official. It is in print. It's published, the end. Now you may have to make changes if you went, oh, me forgot the Wednesday was my birthday. Oh crap, you know, and then you may have to go back in it, but it's easy to go back in and change it and then reprint it and put it on the fridge. Whatever's on the fridge is the official word. Okay. Any questions about that? Okay. All right. Now we're going to move on to grocery shopping. Because once your list is made, then you have to go do the hunting and gathering for all that food, right? 
So one thing that helps me and in our family is I hate going to the store multiple times a week. That drives me bonkers. That feels so efficient, inefficient. It feels annoying. I don't love, you know, going and it, it takes time away from home and every, and especially now I just simply don't have time. So I have a scheduled day and time that I go. Now, um, we have done different things in our shopping. We have done the lost leader shopping where we get all the ads and we spread them out and we go, okay, this week chicken is this price here. So we're going to go to this store for this and this and this, that can help save you money. If you have more time and you like spending a day going shopping, that's a good choice. Uh, we have phased out of that because we found a cheap option in our area that pretty much across the board, it's always going to be cheaper. So that's the store we go to. And I know this is different in different regions and we all are in different places. So um, just kind of feel out if you're not sure, ask neighbors and friends and family members where they go. Uh, we go to kind of a, it's just a cheaper grocery uh, um, outlet. You can't, it's not an outlet, but you can go to grocery outlets. Uh, we jokingly call them the used food store. They're not really used. It's just kind of the train wreck store with the stuff that they've discontinued or they've got a new product or whatever they sell to these grocery outlets. And you can go. The thing about that is that it's often a lot of convenience foods. So we don't do that regularly in our family. Maybe if we have a special event or something or so-and-so has a camp coming up and they need a lot of those kind of foods, we might use that as a choice. But we usually go to one or two places. We have our variety, you know, big box store like Walmart that we go to each week. You might go to Costco each week. Uh, it's funny in our family, even though we're a very large family, we don't actually use Costco and Sam's Club a lot. We may have one or two things. Uh, that's not our main place, but everyone is different. You do what works for your family. So the reason to do this on a scheduled day and time is it helps with poor food choices. We have our list. We know what we're going to need that week. We don't go, ooh, that looks good. Oh, chocolate covered almonds. And then we get some of those. Now that may still happen, but it helps to have this list. You know what you're getting exactly. Uh, my husband, when he makes the list, he's a programmer. So this is his modus operandi. He likes to divide it into how he's going to go through the store. He thinks through these things. Um, having that scheduled day saves on, it helps you plan ahead. So you know when it's not that, oh my gosh, the cupboard is empty. How does this happen? Why does this happen? You know when it's gonna, you're going to get low on stuff, right? You know what day you're going to go. So it cuts down on the whining too. You don't have a kid going, we don't have any bread, you know, as often. It still happens because for some reason, kids eat differently every week, even no matter what the menu says. But it still helps reduce that significantly. It gives your family a rhythm and a schedule. Again, it's the planning, it's the rhythm of your life. Your family knows what to expect. There's not a million questions because, okay, well, we're out of bananas. You know, dad's gonna go shopping Saturday morning. Now for us, we do pick Saturday morning or when I was a stay at home mom, I frequently do would do a weekday in the morning because there was hardly anyone in the store and it just made things easier and quicker. Uh, so we do it Saturday morning now, which can be a little hectic. You have trade-offs. There's less people earlier in the morning on Saturdays. However, my husband, he frequently gets frustrated because there's always people stocking shelves. So you can kind of get an idea of what goes on at the store you'd like to go to. We just, he just knows, okay, there's gonna be people in the aisles stocking things, but at least it's less crowded and crazy town when I go to check out. So that's why he goes then. And that's why I went in the mornings on a weekday because I knew I could just take my time. For me, I liked that time to kind of get out of the house. I didn't get out of the house much. So that was my time. And I would go and I would get out of the house and I would take my little sweet time and I would be my little homemaker self and just go and shop for my family. Now, one thing about this that a menu helps is you are shopping with a list. And a list makes the process faster as we talked about. It avoids impulse purchases as we talked about. And it also helps for if you are a person that uh, hates to go to the store and you want to only do grocery pickup. This is something that wasn't as utilized 
when I was younger and uh, in an inexperienced homemaker. I think we tried it once or twice when I was pregnant when we lived in Provo, Utah, which has which seemed to do it more often because they had a lot of college students. Um, I know some people love this. My daughter-in-law that's in the class right now, I know she loves this. And especially if you're feeling icky, like she's pregnant right now and she's having lots of morning sickness, it's great to just have it. You can either go pick it up in your van where you load the kids up and you just go pick it up or they sometimes deliver it if you use that service. But shopping with a list makes it easier. You just kind of have to, otherwise, oh my goodness, when you have all those choices in front of you on the screen, you, you have to look things up, right? In order to make this list and to fulfill this order. So the list is a powerful, powerful thing and the menu planning makes it possible. Okay, now I'm going to talk briefly about delegating cooking. Put this little feather in your cap, ladies, for when your kids are older and they can help, but it is a wonderful thing to start as soon as you can. Of course, if all you have is a baby, that's that, you know. <laughs> now you can set them in their little bumbo on the counter next to you and they can be with you while you cook and that's a fun thing. And that's a good practice, you know, so they see mom and they are observing. But, or dad, I should say, or dad. Um, Delegating cooking and teaching how to cook is a wonderful parenting practice. It's something that helps your child, again, as we talked about in a previous class, feel like they're really contributing to the family. It's part of your family culture for them to learn these life skills, these adult skills that they are going to need. I know it seems when you're in the thick of all these little kids and nobody knows how to do anything and you're on your own, feels like they're never going to learn, but I promise you, they will, and they will be a huge blessing to your family and to their future families, to their future roommates, to anybody they come across in their lives. You are going to be giving them a tremendous gift. So I highly, strongly recommend that you have a plan for this. Remember when you are teaching children to cook, that it's about training. It is not about perfection. Now, this is when it goes for cleaning too. And I talked about this in the previous video, but really you have to be very patient. It makes more work for you up front. I will admit this very freely, but it is worth it in the end. So you have to let go of your perfection a little bit and you do need to start simply. It's okay to teach a child how to make a peanut butter sandwich. And maybe you have your certain way that you like to do it, but start simple. They don't know. Remember, they haven't experienced life. They're still trying to figure out the thousand ways to spill a cup of milk. They're still, they haven't figured out the 10,000 ways yet. They have to figure it out. They have to find all the ways to fail. And so that's what you're doing is you're going to whew, deep breathing Try and keep it as clean as possible, meaning, hey, you may put cloths down on the floor or have towels ahead of time. Utilize the apron thing. I love aprons. And I think I talked about this in the cleaning video. I get a little bit poetic about aprons, but aprons will make your life and your child's life easier. easier. Just use them. Just use them. It's great. Okay. Start. When I start delegating meals, I start with simple lunches. Lunches are pretty easy, meaning, my three-year-old can get out the bread and the peanut butter and the jelly and put them on the counter with a knife and say, yay, okay, lunch, right? And this is when you can even make this a project tech all around the table and everybody can make their sandwich. You put out some chips or some carrots, ta-da, you got lunch, some apples, something. Okay, so that's a simple thing. I have been amazed at how proud my little ones are of being able to contribute. And I'm on lunch, I'm on lunch, I'm on lunch. And their little hearts break if someone else just gets this, oh, come on, it's just so it doesn't get them. You have to kind of get your teenagers to not tread on their little toes and let them do it. So another thing that is easy, to, you can either start with it or we have moved on to it is breakfast. Cereal's an easy thing to get out. Get out the milk, get out the cereal, get out the bowls and the spoons, ta-da. I made breakfast. I'm so proud. You know, um, toast is a great thing. I like to teach the youngest ones to start to make early on. 
So remember, you're phasing them into this. This is not like today is lunch, tomorrow is breakfast, and then the next day you're on dinner, kid, get busy. This is a gradual over the years thing, okay? This is practice. Think about how much you had to practice to learn different skills, even like math or music or different things like that. It takes a while, right? This is your training ground. You are training these little people. So when they get older, actually, I'm gonna jump in ahead here. When they're about eight or nine, especially young ladies, at least in our family, seem to get a fascination with baking and they wanna to learn to make cookies and cake and brownies and all of that. So that is a great way to train. Um, it's a great place to make mistakes because it wasn't like dinner that's burned and now nobody has anything to eat. It's like a snack that was like, if they burn it or mess it up, well, crud, you know, we were hoping for brownies, but okay, we'll just, you know, buy some store-bought cookies or whatever. So that is something that is a great place for those middle, I don't wanna call them middle ages, but for those elementary school ages to let them try. now. In saying this, I want to say that they need supervision. <laughs> it's just like anything else, just because they know how to make eggs doesn't know they already all of a sudden know how to make chocolate chip cookies. You're gonna have to uh, help them a little bit with this. And I learned this the hard way. I have a daughter now who is an excellent baker. In fact, she had her own baking business for a number of years and she really is a great cook and baker. But when she was about eight years old and still learning, she was not really strong on fractions. In fact, we hadn't gotten to fractions yet. She didn't really know what fractions were. So you can imagine how that went when she went in the kitchen and went, I'm gonna make cookies. But she didn't know what a fraction was. So we ended up with some cookies that had 11 cups of sugar in them. <laughs> I don't know how that's even possible. I must have really been busy with a baby or something if I didn't even notice that was going on. But they were very interesting cookies. <laughs> Let me tell you, another daughter, I think she used salt in place of sugar one time and that didn't work, um, but they learned. And then we had a lovely little math lesson on fractions <laughs> really quickly. And uh, we incorporated that into our homeschool, as you can imagine. So that's another step there. So you've got breakfast and lunches then you've got some baking. And then as they get older, around 12, 13, 14, I start giving them dinner assignments. Now, these are simple dinners, okay? This is not uh, chicken cordon bleu or something, okay? This is simple, easy, and again, you have to train this. You can start for lunches or dinners with like macaroni and cheese. Uh, pastas are pretty easy. And once they learn that skill, then you can branch out into other pastas, right? So if they start with macaroni and cheese, at least they know how to cook the pasta now and how to drain it and all of that business, which can be kind of scary because it's, you know, hot steam and you need to help them and watch them until they get used to that. Then you can add spaghetti. Then you can add other things, right? So again, it's a gradual thing. On your list of dinners that you have, maybe you put a star by the easy ones that you know kids can start with, right? And then I give them that same dish for a while, okay? This is not every night, it's a different thing. And when they start out, they probably have one dinner a week that they're taking over. That can be overwhelming for them as it is. Don't give them a whole bunch. So again, simplify line upon line, step upon step, just a little bit, baby steps at a time. Okay. Then you can start as they get older and get more experience and they start to want to try new things or maybe they don't, but you want them to. Then they can move on to different dishes. Maybe they might start to have things that they want to try or that they're, hey, so-and-so eats this at their house. Could we try that? Oh, did you get the recipe? You could get the recipe from them and then you could try it. We'll see if it works in our family. I like to think through things that they may want to learn, that they're going to want to understand in their lives and maybe add one or two of those on the list to kind of sneak in. Okay, this meal assignment goes right along with planning the menu, as I said before. I add a little, not a column, but a, a line on my spreadsheet. And then I just put little names in there above those certain days. And then they know, you know, oh, I'm on dinner that day. Okay. One of the funnest things we have done, one of the few things, parenting things, I feel like I've been successful at that we have done in our family is we have introduced when they start cooking, they get their own cookbook. Now, this is just a three ring binder. As you can see, it's falling apart but I give them a three ring binder with some dividers, which you can get at the dollar store, super cheap. 
I get some page protectors, which you can even get at many dollar stores, and they have their recipes. Now, when they are learning to write, I like doing this in the elementary years because then they can copy down the recipes that there are their favorites and they love to do actually because then it's in their book. They can decorate it as you can see how they want to. It's funny to see this cover because this child is now 14 and she's actually a very good artist. This is like from when she was probably eight, seven or eight, but she drew this. Um, but she goes, they go back to it. It's her cookbook. And um, so she took one of my recipes and she just printed it out. And um, sometimes they copy recipes and they'll just stick them in the book. And then other times they write them out. I can see she hasn't written out a lot of hers, but they like to decorate the sections. And then whenever they learn a recipe, then they can put it in their book. I think over time, they've just started, they'll just copy some of my recipes and stick them in here. They may not even know how to cook them, but in the beginning, I wouldn't let them put it in there unless they learned how to make it, <laughs> which is kind of funny. I am noticing a lot of recipes in here that she took from my recipe book. Hmm. She didn't even copy. <laughs> anyway, but here, this one's in a page protector thing and they can wipe it off. They don't always, but they can. Then the coolest thing is, they are building this their whole lives in your home. And I've done this long enough and I now have married kids. They take it with them and they, they have the recipes. Um, this has been such a blessing to them and a bless, it blesses us because they are contributing to the family. And then they have this adult, they have this manifestation of everything they've learned. They take with them into their adult lives. It's really been a cool thing to do. And it's one thing we've been consistent on and that because we've done it all this time, we can see the fruits of that effort. And it's a really cool thing. Now, sometimes we may go, where is that recipe? I thought we had this such and such recipe. Oh, I think that's in so-and-so's book. Oh, I better email her or call her and say, can you send me that recipe back please? Or put it in the Google docs and we need to start sharing in our Google docs more so we can all print them out. Now, one cool thing about a Google Docs um, and something I do actually even with my cousins and my aunts and uncles is we have a Google Doc folder that we use for our heritage recipes. This is something, oh my goodness, it not makes me cry. Um, I was very close to my, both my grandmothers growing up, but one in particular lived down the street. And so um, we did a lot as a family, my mother's family. Um, and so, but all kinds of people, I got this recipe from my aunt on the other side of the family, my dad's sister, she has since passed away and I can't get this recipe anymore. I'm so glad I wrote it down. I printed it out and I stuck it in my book. Um, but I really feel that this is an important thing. And especially as Thanksgiving is coming closer, it's a great time. Seize the day, carpe diem. Ask the people in your lives that you care about now what some of those recipes are. See if they've already got them typed up and in Google Docs. And if not, ask them to put them there. Or if they give them to you or email them to you, then you can put them in your Google Docs and share them with other family members. To me, this is such a heartwarming, important thing. Um, it has been a huge blessing in my life. This recipe here, it's kind of yellowed. I don't know if you can see it. And of course it's backwards. It's splattered with all kinds of stuff. These are recipes I copied as an 18 year old um, before I left home. And they're from, this one's from my aunt and this other one's from my grandma. And I write down who they're from and I can see my handwriting from the time. Uh, there's some recipes in here. I have little people autographs on, uh, which is kind of funny especially now that they're like 25. <laughs> and it just becomes a little piece of family history that I just, I just, I know I'm going off on this probably too long, but I just love the idea of that. And I just, that's just one, another idea you can do. But for me, I love it. Then, you know, I'm, as Thanksgiving is coming, Christmas is coming, you know where those recipes are and you can share them with your children and pass them on. And it becomes uh, family legacy that is just priceless. You can't replace that. So 
anybody have any questions about delegating or about keeping a recipe book or going grocery shopping or any of the things we've talked about? Or any comments? You can share your thoughts too. I know I talk a lot. All right. Well, I hope this has been helpful for you and given you a few ideas. I do have an assignment for you this week. This week's assignment is for you to try making a menu this week. And if all it is is just breakfast, or if all it is is just you know lunches or dinners, maybe it's just dinners, right? Maybe you already have a system for your breakfast and lunches. I'm just going to encourage you. Now, if you already make a menu and you're already on the ball, hey, just share yours with us next time and what works for you. I would like to do that at the beginning of every class, share what has worked or what you did with your assignment this week. So does that sound like a doable assignment? Awesome. Okay. If no one has any other questions or comments, I think we're going to end. And I so appreciate you coming to Homemaker University. Again, if you, any of you need the recordings from previous classes, just message me on Facebook or email me, whatever contact information you have for me. I will be happy to send those links. I have been putting them all on YouTube. Um, they are unlisted, so they are not public. They won't be public until our course is done. So I'm hoping to finish this course uh, before Christmas. So we will not meet, just remember, the week of Thanksgiving or, yeah, we're not going to meet. I don't want to meet on a Wednesday night on the night before Thanksgiving and it's not Friday morning either. So we will not meet at all Thanksgiving week, but we will meet next week. So um, just let me know if you need those videos again, if you need the link to them and uh, please feel free to watch them or use them whenever you need to and feel free to message me or email me with questions at any time. I am happy to help especially with any questions you might have about assignments or things that I've said, if anything I've said is confusing. So thank you so much for coming to class today. I hope you have a wonderful day and you have a wonderful week cooking and caring and nurturing your families. Have a good Friday. Bye, Delilah. <laughs>